Okay. Kindly drop a message in the chat room. Good evening. I'm Dr. Chidebele Ojuku. I'm sorry for whatever inconveniences I've caused you this evening. Technical problems are responsible. I had to mute everyone so that the, the floor won't be noisy. Kindly drop a message in the chat room. Okay, good evening all. You're welcome, Stella, Ade, Fisayo, Chidima, everyone, welcome. Let's get started for the sake of time. Okay, today's class is on incontinence. This week, we are celebrating World, uh, this is World Continence Week, in fact. 17th to 23rd of June, Max World Continence Week. So this presentation is um, just a way of marking the World Continence Week to educate the public on what incontinence is all about. Unfortunately, most people that registered for this event are not here because of the technical problems. But two things, I'm recording this session and um, I may have to refix so that others can participate as well. Okay, I would, I would like to ask us a question before we start. Do you leak urine, pass gas, or feces when you cough, sneeze, laugh, lift objects, bend down, exercise sometimes you find out that when you are in the gym you are leaking some drops of urine when you have sex for some women this may not be noticeable amongst men but for some women during intercourse they leak urine and sometimes they they may even confuse it with um, other vaginal fluid but it's not necessarily the same do you leak urine before getting to the toilet? For some of us, before we get to the toilet, we are already leaking. We can't hold back. Or for no obvious reason. If you fall into any of these categories, even if the leakage is in drops or large quantities, it's possible that you may have some form of incontinence. And that takes us to the topic of today, incontinence. What is incontinence? Incontinence simply means you cannot control urine, gas, or feces from leaking out. As much as possible, this presentation is so simplified because the majority of the, of the viewers were supposed to be those who are not in the medical profession. So it's as simple as possible to enable us to understand. But that doesn't stop us from um raising issues where we need clarifications thank you so incontinence means you cannot control the the passage of urine gas or feces in other sense you find out you leak urine or you leak gas or you leak feces it's either you have urinary incontinence which is the commonest and um, today's presentation may basically be based on urinary incontinence it's either you have urinary incontinence, meaning you are leaking only urine, or you pass gas uncontrollably. This one is actually very common. You find out that for some females, I've seen some females who said they pass gas during intercourse or as they are trying to pick up something or whatever. So this gas incontinence is also very common. Then the one that is not as common as the others is fecal incontinence. Fecal incontinence means you leak or you pass feces without um, being able to control it. Before you know what's happening, you're already um, pooing. Or you may have a combination of urinary gas and fecal, as the case may be. But the commonest of them all is urinary incontinence. Now, let's look at the categories of urinary incontinence. You should be able to 
decipher the type of urinary incontinence you have, if that is what you have. I'm narrowing down to urinary incontinence because that's the commonest one. But that doesn't mean that um, what we are saying doesn't cover for gas or fecal. It still covers for gas and fecal. But I'm concentrating on urinary because it's the commonest. If you leak urine during activities like coughing, laughing, exercising, dancing, standing up from sitting, and so on and so forth. In fact, if you leak urine on exertion, once you exert, you find out that urine is dropping, then it's possible you have stress incontinence. From the name, stress, stress incontinence. And that's the commonest of them all. Most uh, people have stress incontinence. Then we also have the next category, which is urge incontinence. At the end of today's class, you should be able to know what type of incontinence you have. If you leak urine, um, and then in addition to that, you also have sudden or strong desire to urinate. You find out that before you get to the toilet, you're already peeing. Or each time you want to, each time you want to pee, it's as if you can't control the urge. Then it's possible you have urge incontinence. In the second, in the situation of urge incontinence, the bladder may not be full, but you just find out that um, you always feel as if your bladder is full. <clears throat> but the bladder may not necessarily be full, and you cannot control it. Sometimes before you get to, uh, once you get to your door. To open the door, you're already leaking urine. If you're in the shower, once you hear the sound of water, or you are washing the, <coughs> you are washing your dishes. <coughs> Excuse me, you start leaking urine. <coughs> <coughs> okay, sorry. Then we have another category: <coughs> overflow incontinence. Overflow incontinence means you are unable to completely empty your bladder. If you go to the toilet to pee, you just pee a little and it stops. And before you know what's happening, you start dribbling urine. <coughs> what happens is that you don't empty your bladder completely. Okay, so you always have retention in the bladder. And before you know what's happening, it's leaking out. Excuse me. <coughs> So, and um, in overflow incontinence, you may not actually feel the urge to urinate, but you just dribble because your bladder is always having urine inside of it. Then the next one is functional incontinence. If you have functional incontinence, that doesn't mean you have a problem with your, um, you may not necessarily have a problem with your pelvic floor muscles or bladder or so on and so forth. It's just that due to physical or mental limitations, you are unable to reach the toilet. You find out that if you have functional incontinence, you may feel the urge or the need to urinate, but you cannot get to the toilet because of a physical problem. For example, if you have osteoarthritis, or you have, um, or you are depressed or something. You are just sitting at a place. You want to urinate. You have the urge, but you can't get to the toilet. Sometimes you you may be outside in a public place. You want to urinate, but you cannot get to the toilet, or there is no toilet available or close to you. Then you find yourself dribbling urine. That's functional incontinence. It doesn't necessarily mean you have a pathological condition. Okay, this is usually temporary. Once you get rid of the physical or mental limitation, then you are good to go. Then the final category is mixed incontinence. Mixed incontinence means you have a combination of two types of incontinence. It's either, um, in fact, commonly is a combination of stress and urge incontinences. This is quite common too. Now, for the different categories, for those of us that have incontinence in this class, I hope you are able to decipher the type of incontinence or the category you belong to from these simple explanations.
Now, for whatever category you belong to, there may be different causes. It's either you have problems with your bladder or you have problems with the nerves supplying the bladder or the muscles around your pelvic region. When we talk about nerves, nerves are just pathways. Okay, they, they send signal from your organs to the brain, from the brain to the organs. That's what I mean by nerves. So the bladder or nerves may be dysfunctional, or you have a problem with your pelvic floor muscles. But for most incontinence cases, for 90 something percent of incontinence cases, the pelvic floor muscles are weak. Even if you have problems with your bladder or nerves, most times you find out that the pelvic floor muscles will be compromised as well. That takes us to the question of what are these pelvic floor muscles? I'm sure you can see, um, you can um, touch most of the muscles around or in your body. If you touch your arm, your forearm, your leg, your abdomen, your face, you can feel some muscles. But these pelvic floor muscles are a group of muscles that you cannot even see. You can't even feel them. And the truth is that most of us do not know that there are some categories of muscles referred to as the pelvic floor muscles. I'll give you a very simple explanation of the pelvic floor muscles. Um, you can see a, a, a blue color cylinder or a bucket or a basin on your screen. If you stand behind that, uh, this cylinder, if you stand here facing the cylinder and this green mirror, if you stand here at the back of this cylinder, assuming that this cylinder is now in front of you, I want to use it to explain where the pelvic floor muscles are. If this cylinder is standing in front of you, okay, this is your diaphragm, up this way, you have your head, your chest is up this way, and your head up. I hope you can all see my cursor. Then, in front of you, this represents your abdomen. This edge of the cylinder represents your abdomen, which you can touch. Then this edge represents your back, which you can also touch. Then, below this cylinder, if you open up your legs and put your hand, touch your vagina or your penis, that area is where you have your pelvic floor muscles. At the base is where you have your pelvic floor muscles. Let me show you another picture that can explain. This is a man and this is a woman. Both of them are lying down facing me and you. They are also facing you. So <clears throat> this is the man's buttocks. Sorry, this is his buttocks. This is her buttocks. If you lie down facing a mirror or you lie down facing me, this is what I, we can see. Now, you can see this man's penis here. You can see his anus, where he pulls from. This is his penis. At the tip of it, you have a hole where he urinates from and all that. Then, around it, and even on it, you can see these brown things. They represent the pelvic floor muscles. These muscles you cannot see ordinarily, okay? Because you should know that the, uh, the skin is covering them. So even if you are lying down now in front of a mirror, you won't see the muscles, but you can feel, you can touch where they are, okay? If this is a woman and she's lying down facing me and you, <clears throat> this is her clitoris. This is her clitoris above. If you move down, you see the urethra. The urethra is the hole where urine comes out from. I'm taking time to explain this thing because we need to know where these muscles are. You can't talk about incontinence without talking about the pelvic floor muscles. If you don't know where the pelvic floor muscles are, you cannot exercise them correctly. And don't be amazed to know that some women are not even aware that they have three holes down there. 
Someone said she can't hear me. What's the problem? Please check your check your microphone or your speaker, whichever one. So the urethra is where pee comes out from. You move down, you see the vagina, which is where uh, the hole where the penis inserts during sexual intercourse. If you move down towards the back, you see the anus. So if this is a woman, she has three holes here. You now find out that surrounding these holes are these brown muscles, which are the pelvic floor muscles. Okay, so if you lie down, bend your knees, or face the mirror, you should know where these muscles are. Can we quickly look at what puts you at risk of incontinence? Number one, for the women, pregnancy. Being pregnant puts you at risk of developing an incontinence. Why? A lot of factors. I'll just mention a few. Number one is hormonal changes. You know, when you are pregnant, you have a lot of uh, changes in hormones, which soften those pelvic floor muscles. You also have added weight. When you are pregnant, um, the weight of the fetus or the baby you are having inside of you, the increase the size of the womb, everything starts pressing down on your pelvic floor muscles. And before you know what's happening, these muscles keep stretching until they become non-functional. That's why a lot of pregnant women leak urine. And even after childbirth, most of them continue leaking urine. Childbirth is another one. During childbirth, you have a lot of stress in that region, a lot of trauma. Some women undergo tears, episiotomies. Even if you don't have tears and episiotomies, the stretching of these muscles during childbirth, you can imagine this is where the baby comes out from, the vagina here. So for, you, for the baby's head to pass through, they'll be stretching all over this uh, region. Okay, just like a rubber band. When you stretch a rubber band and then it goes beyond its limit, you find out that it gets very weak and may not be able, it won't uh, retain its elasticity again. Another factor is overweight or obesity. For people who are overweight or obesity, they have increased abdominal fat, which presses down on the pelvic floor muscles. Urinary tract infection is another for men and for women. Overweight or obesity also counts for men too. Urinary tract infection, infection is a very common cause of incontinence. Age. As we age, the pelvic floor muscles become weaker and um, less functional as they were. That's why most older people leak urine and some of them even pass, uh, uh, pass a whole... Um, um, they can fill a bucket of urine without knowing that that actually passing urine. Menopause is another one. If when women tend towards menopause or when they reach menopause, there are a lot of hormonal changes that also affect the structure and the function of the pelvic floor muscles. Pelvic uh, surgeries. If you've undergone surgeries like um, um, hysterectomy and so on and so forth, Surgeries that involve the organs in your pelvis, the bladder, and so on and so forth. It's possible that you may start experiencing incontinence. Prostate disorders are another. For men who have prostate enlargement, prostate cancer, they usually come down with incontinence. If you have bladder stones or tumor, you will also encounter some form of incontinence, especially the overflow incontinence. Most times when you urinate, you are unable to empty the bladder fully. For those who also have nerve, spinal cord, or brain injuries, incontinence is also common. Other diseases like diabetes can make you experience incontinence. If you also have chronic cough, this is common with smokers. People that smoke usually come down with chronic cough. Or even if you don't have, even if you're not a smoker, and you usually have cough, it's possible you may have incontinence because once you are coughing, you are applying pressure to the pelvic floor muscles. And before you know what's happening, you start leaking urine. Constipation and straining. For those that are always constipated, 
if you're always constipated, that means that when you want to poo, you strain. And as long as you strain while pooing, you are adding pressure to these muscles. Smoking, I've talked about smoking and its relationship with a chronic cough and um, how it causes incontinence. Alcohol consumption or taking caffeine and carbonated drinks will also increase your likelihood of developing incontinence. If you're also on some medications like antihypertensives or sedatives, incontinence is also common. Okay, most times it may not necessarily be that um, the pelvic floor muscles are, are weak, or even if they're weak, they may not be extremely weak. It's just that some antihypertensives are diuretics. They increase your tendency of urinating. So when you have these, um, when you take these medications, you find out that you leak urine most times without knowing. If you also have a family history of incontinence, it's likely you may have one. Now, the question is, if you have incontinence, do you really need to have it checked out? Yes, of course, you should. I want to be sure you are all hearing me and you are following. Can someone drop a message in the chat room if you can hear me? Thank you. If you have incontinence, please have it checked out so that it doesn't get more complicated. Incontinence can get more complicated than you expect. If those muscles are weak, as days goes by, they continue. They keep, um, they keep getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And the weaker they get, the more problems you may experience. For example, if you have incontinence, you may develop prolapse. Prolapse is um, a situation whereby your internal organs start coming out from the... Okay, for example... If you have a prolapse, your cervix or your uterus or your womb may start coming out through your vagina or your rectum may start coming out through your anus, okay? So that's what prolapse is all about. That's why you need to manage any case of incontinence so that it doesn't get complicated. If you are a woman, the more children you have or the more pregnancies you go through, the higher the tendency, the, the, the weaker the pelvic floor muscles get. If you also, um, as you also age, whether you are a man or woman, whether you're a man or woman, if you are getting uh, old or nearing menopause, <clears throat> the severity of the incontinence increases. Incontinence can also lead to infections like urinary tract infections. Why? because you're always wet down there, okay? And your panties are always wet. You find out that getting a urinary tract infection is very common, and that's why you need to check it out. If you have incontinence, it's likely you may have sexual problems. Why? These mu those muscles I showed you, let me go back. You see these muscles? You find out that these muscles are encircling the penis are encircling this whole area. The, these muscles that control urine flow also are responsible for gaining or maintaining an erection. So if those muscles are weak and you are having incontinence, it's likely you will also have issues, you may have issues with um, your sexual performance. If you are a woman, you will also find out that these muscles encircle the vagina as well. Now, what are, if these muscles are weak, the vagina gets very loose and lax. And what is the problem? What happens? You find out that during intercourse, you may not feel the penis or your partner may not feel a tight grip when he penetrates. So that's another problem. You start experiencing sexual problems. That's one of the reasons why you need to have it checked out. And um, incontinence will also affect your social and personal life. If you have incontinence and you are in this class, you can attest to this. You find out that it's a serious problem. Um, you may not want to talk to anybody about it. You may not have even talked to anybody about it before. This may be your first time of um, getting involved in an open discussion of incontinence. 
So if you have incontinence, it affects your personal life, it affects your social life. You won't want to go to the gym. You don't want to go for a party. You don't want to wear some particular clothes so that you don't drip urine and so on and so forth. Now, what should you do when you have incontinence? I'll advise you to do three things if you have incontinence. Number one, see a doctor or see a women's health physiotherapist for a more thorough evaluation and prescription. As well, as much as I'm going to give you a tip on how to do pelvic floor muscle exercises in this class, and I will also share some coping strategies, you need to see a doctor or see your women's health physiotherapist for a thorough assessment. Okay, and then um, in as much as I told you the types of incontinence we have, and now you already know if you have stress or urge or overflow or functional, but it's still good you, you see your healthcare provider. I'll tell us some uh, coping strategies that we can adopt to manage, uh, it may not necessarily, that the coping strategies do not manage incontinence, they just help you cope with incontinence. And finally, I'll talk about the pelvic floor muscle exercises. The coping strategies, number one, if you're a smoker, stop smoking, please. Reduce your consumption of alcohol, caffeine, and carbonated drinks. If you're overweight, lose weight. That's another way to handle incontinence. But losing weight doesn't mean you won't do your pelvic floor muscle exercises. Those muscles are already weak. So you need to tone them up as much as you are losing weight. Keep a bladder diary. What is a bladder diary? If you have a bladder diary, you can, you can, it can be on your phone or on a paper. Each time you pee, you drop a, you, 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 record, you, you write it down. Maybe you peed by five, not dribbling urine or leaking urine. Each time you go to the toilet to empty your bladder, you note the time. It's possible that you have a, you, your, your body has a pee pattern that you are not used to. It's just, a, it's just like some of us who wake up in the morning and poo. Maybe your poo pattern is that each time you wake up in the morning, you poo. For some people, they don't poo until they get to the office. For some, they don't poo until they get back home. Same applies to your pee. Most of us have pee patterns. Even if you take um, two glasses of water and you find out that you may not have the urge to urinate, until maybe gets to a particular time. It happens in some person. So it's good you study your pee pattern. It helps you know when to go to the toilet to empty your bladder to prevent dribbling or leaking. You should also avoid clothing that are tight around the tummy. That uh, also applies to wearing girdles and postpartum belts. For women who wear girdles and postpartum belts, it will actually, it will, you find out that when you wear these girdles or postpartum belts, you tend to drip more urine or you tend to leak more urine because it compresses your abdomen and presses down on your pelvic floor muscles. So if you have incontinence, avoid these tight clothing on the abdomen. You should also wear free and easy to pull clothing to avoid difficulty when you want to pee. This applies for those who have urge incontinence. If you have urge incontinence and you know that each time you want to pee, it's like you're in a hurry, you can't control it. Avoid wearing very tight inner wears so that once you rush, get to the toilet, you can quickly pull down. These are coping strategies, not management strategies, remember. You wear more of black outfits. You find out that most people who have incontinence wear black pants or black trousers or black skirts to shield the wet stains. You should also plan where to sit when traveling or if you are out in public. If you, are, if you, go, if you go out or you are traveling, you should um, mind where you are sitting. It's better you sit closer to the exits or to the bedroom, okay? Then empty your bladder before any physical activity. If you want to go to the gym or you want to do some exercises, Make it um,
Hello. Hey. Can you hear me now? Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. I'm so sorry. Oh. Ah, voila. Okay. So, well. so let me let me that means let me go back. Let me go back from where you stopped hearing me. This was where you stopped, Abby. I talked about the knack technique. I said we should master the knack technique. I'm going to tell you what the mark technique, the knack technique is all about. The knack technique is a quick and simple technique that helps prevent and reduce urine leakage. Each time you want to cough or laugh, sneeze, get up from sitting, lift an object, blow your nose, <coughs> Each time you want to exert, just do the knack. What is the knack? Knack means each time you want to exert, you lift and squeeze your pelvic floor muscles. In the next uh, slide, I'll show you how to identify your pelvic floor muscles. So whenever you want to exert, you just tighten these muscles. Remember, if you want to cough, you always have a way of putting your hand on your mouth each time you want to cough. If you want to blow your nose, you always put a hanky on your nose if you want to blow your nose. So the knack technique is what you should always do if you have incontinence. Each time you want to laugh, tighten your pelvic floor muscle. If you want to lift, carry, lift something up, tighten your pelvic floor muscle. That way, you don't dribble or you don't leak urine. Now, let's look at how to identify the pelvic floor muscle. For you to um, exercise your pelvic floor muscles or perform the knack technique, which I talked about, you must be able to identify your pelvic floor muscles. I showed you a picture of the pelvic floor muscles. Now, from the picture, from the, from the picture, you find out that these muscles are not something you can touch, unlike the arm or the face muscles. For you to identify these muscles, you have to apply some techniques that will help you pick the muscles up. I'll share some. If you don't identify these muscles, whatever you are doing, you are wasting effort. You are wasting your time doing pelvic floor muscle exercises. I'll share two... Um, I'll share two strategies that will help you identify the pelvic floor muscles. If you are a woman and you are here, sitting down, lying down, standing up, whichever way, just imagine that you are peeing. Imagine you are urinating in the toilet and you don't urinate on yourself now. Just imagine that you are urinating and you hear the sound of an alarm and you want to quickly hold back urine. You quickly hold back urine. Once you do that, you've picked up your pelvic floor muscles. This is a very common strategy that is taught everywhere. But sometimes, some women say that they're unable to um, um, get it right because they can't imagine stopping urine flow. But if you sit still, get into a comfortable sitting position, or you lie down and bend your knees, quietly open, your, um, open up your knees a bit. Then imagine you are urinating. This applies for men and women, not just women. Imagine you are urinating and you try to stop urine flow. When you are doing this, don't squeeze your buttocks and don't hold your breath. If you find it difficult to imagine that you are stopping urine flow, I'll share a YouTube video. I did a video, I just did a very short video that will give you other options on how to pick up the pelvic floor muscle. I didn't want this class to be very lengthy, so I had to quickly do that short video because 
if we start talking about identifying or picking up the pelvic floor muscles in this class, then it may take another 20 minutes for us to do that. I'll, <clears throat> I'll drop a link or if you registered for this course earlier, I'll be sending out the, the YouTube video to your emails. Then you can look at it later. If you are a man and you want to pick up your pelvic floor muscles, you draw up your penis inwards towards your body. Just try to pull your penis inwards towards your body. Don't pull, don't, don't move your, your waist backwards. So just your penis. Be, um, um, sit at a place or lie at a place. Be still. Just move only that region. Pull your penis towards your body. Then imagine stopping the flow of urine. When you, when, you are, when you are peeing and someone calls you, ah, Oga, see your wallet on the floor, and you quickly hold back urine to pick up your wallet before Agberos or so snatch it. Just imagine when you do that, and you are also drawing your penis backwards. That's for the guys. If you are unable to feel anything from these two explanations, the YouTube video may help you, or you can contact me later for more. Now, have you, did, you, did you feel anything? Can we drop something in the chat room? <clears throat> did anybody feel anything when he or she <clears throat> did that? <clears throat> Can I see you writing? <clears throat> did you feel anything? When you try to stop the flow of urine or you pulled your penis towards you, not your waist, towards not, not moving your waist as if you are dancing a willow, just your penis only. Did you feel anything? Okay. Now you were able to pick up your pelvic floor muzzle. You hold, okay. Um, for you to do a pelvic floor muzzle exercise, what do you do? You pick up your muzzle. Now that we are doing testing, testing, you pick up your muzzle, you do that again, do that imagination and hold for three seconds, then you release. You do that again, you hold for three seconds and you release. Now let me explain Kegel's exercise or pelvic floor muzzle exercise. Kegel's exercise is to be done in the following steps. First of all, okay, thank you. I can see those of you that dropped comments. If you were not able to pick up, when you watch the YouTube video, you may, you may see other options that will likely help you. Now, pick up the pelvic, okay, for men, let me also add that, in addition to um, controlling or managing incontinence, Kegel's exercise or pelvic floor muscle exercise will also help to improve sexual performances because once these muscles are toned up, once these muscles are toned up, be you a man, be you a woman, it improves your pelvic, uh, sorry, your sexual performances. Now, the first thing you should do when you want to do your Kegel's exercise is to get into a comfortable position. It's either you are sitting down with your back straight and your knees slightly apart, or you lie on your back, bend your knees, open up your knees a bit, or you can stand up, whatever you want, whichever way you want to do it. But it's best to be in sitting or in lying, or even in standing, because this is an exercise you can do anywhere. Believe you me, incontinence, if you are taking drugs for incontinence, to stop the flow of urine or to help you stop leaking. Let me ask you a question. How long will you take those drugs? If you are opting for surgery, see, you need to know the level of the incontinence before surgery becomes an option. Kegel's exercise remains the key to managing incontinence everywhere, all around the world is the key. Okay, so if you have incontinence and you're not doing Kegels, you are missing out. 
take this exercise seriously. I'll also do more YouTube videos on Kegel's exercise for our benefit. Now, get into a comfortable position, pick up the pelvic floor muscles, like I explained, lift and squeeze for 10 seconds. If you've picked up these muscles, hold it for 10 seconds. 10 seconds means one, two, three, you count 10. And you release. Always release. Don't hold and hold and hold. See, let me tell you, for some persons who have incontinence, their problem may not be weak pelvic floor muscles. There are some people who their problem is that they are unable to relax their pelvic floor muscles. So when you are doing your pelvic floor exercises, when you are doing your pelvic floor muscle exercises, you should always uh, release or relax after holding back. Can you hear me? Someone said she can't hear me. Can you hear me? Then you repeat this eight to 12 times. Pick up your pelvic floor muscles, lift and squeeze for 10 seconds. Then you repeat eight to 12 times. Okay, thank you. You do this three times daily. If you have incontinence, do your Kegels exercise three times daily. If you are just a beginner in Kegels, you can start repeating eight times. Maybe if you pick up the muscles, you count 10, you release. You pick up again, you count 10, you release. You can do this five times or 10 times, depending on how much you can go. Then maybe after the first week, you increase. If you are doing eight times, you can start doing nine times at a go. But always do this exercise three times daily. Most people will tell you to do your pelvic floor muscle exercises every one hour. Yes, that's okay. Most times I recommend that for uh, my clients too. You can do it every one hour. You can do it each time you hear the sound of an alarm or your baby cries or so on and so forth, or each time you're in the shower. But sometimes you find out that you may forget. And if you count the number of times you've done this exercise in a day, you may not have met up with the, with the required or the recommended um, frequency or duration and so on and so forth. Now, the best thing is to do it in the morning. If you wake up in the morning, you do your pelvic floor muscle exercises. You can do it while saying your morning prayers or your morning devotion. In the afternoon, whether you are at work or in the market, wherever you are, you do it. And then in the evening, you do your Kegel's exercise. In addition to this um, picking up uh, the muscles, lifting and squeezing and so on and so forth, we also have other modifications of Kegel's that can help you. But I'm not taking everything in this presentation for the sake of time. This was actually supposed to be a 30-minute discussion and then that's it. So, but if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, you will get more um, updates, okay? You can actually activate your Kegel, your pelvic floor muscle exercises by doing abdominal muscle exercises. You can activate them by doing some um, exercises on the thighs. There are many other ways you can activate these muscles in addition to Kegels. They are all adjuncts of Kegels exercise. So maybe if I have your email, I'll keep sending updates. So I've talked about the video link that I'll share. In conclusion, we've talked about incontinence. And from everything we've said today, I want to let you know that incontinence is not a condition that doesn't have a cure. It does have a remedy, a, a big time remedy for it. And then speak out if you have incontinence. Stop bottling it up. You know the truth, many people have incontinence. You're not alone. So stop bottling it up or stop seeing it as something that is out of the ordinary. The truth of, um, apart from the Aside the problem I had on Facebook Live, you would have seen the number of, um, of persons that would have attended this class. I had a lot of, ah, someone said she can't hear me. What's the problem again? 
many people many people registered for this incontinence class from all over the globe because the facebook ad reached everywhere so um that's enough to let you know that for up to three thousand persons to register for this class that means many people have incontinence you're not alone so speak up seek help practice your kegels exercise or your pelvic floor muscle exercise very very important always do the knack technique each time you want to exact do your knack technique and um if you feel you need um, you need to discuss more on this incontinence or you want us to to maybe if you don't have a women's health physiotherapist around you that you can contact you can hit me up for maybe some tele um advices and so on and so forth or we can follow you up thank you for listening i'll take your comments i'll take your questions um i brought you this presentation from preggies and mamas i'm the founder of preggies and mamas I, for, I forgot to mention that at the beginning of the class preggies and mamas is an online community for women pregnant women and um postpartum mothers but our activities are not limited to pregnant and postpartum women we reach out to everybody as long as women's health is concerned we also do health education and promotion. The main reason I set up Preggies and Mamas is for health promotion and education. Because I found out that we lack knowledge in this part of the country. So Preggies and Mamas is always educating or promoting health. You can like my Facebook page so that you always get updates. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I also have a Facebook group, Preggies and Mamas. You can join us. Or you can visit my website, www.preggiesandmamas.com for more information. If you have a group of people you want me to talk to, women, men, mixed population, you want us to talk to them, give them some form of health education, um, book an appointment with us on the website or send me a private message. We do online health promotion. We do um, on-site health promotion. I also have classes. Okay, we also have, um, okay, my YouTube channel. Um, Dr. Chidebele Ojuku, I think that's the name of my channel. Dr. Chidebele Ojuku, yes. But you can also drop your email addresses or let me drop my phone number in the chat room. You can also drop your email addresses. I'll send you the YouTube video, then you subscribe. You will keep getting videos down to um, ergonomics, ways you can, uh, childcare practices, everything concerning women's health and men's health. My Instagram and Twitter handle, preggies underscore mamas. I'm not a baba on Instagram and, and Twitter, I'm still learning, but whichever way, you can follow me there. Join my Facebook group. Okay, from next week, we are going to be launching um, um a week a topic for women because this COVID 19 period has taken many women away from the hospital people are not going to the hospital they're not attending antenatal or postnatal classes so i have a whatsapp group anyway where i educate women but we'll be taking it on our facebook group subsequently too every week we'll take a topic to cover up for what people are missing um from running away from the hospitals Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Please send, the, send your email to my phone number so that I'll collect it after this. Can I take your comments? Thank you very much. Adeyin, thank you. Thank you. Charity, send to my phone number. Send it to my phone number. Send your email there. Elamua, thank you. Modu, thank you very much. Thank you. Can I take your questions and comments? Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Ma. Dr. Odole, thank you. Thank you. Who is asking the first question?
I recorded this presentation. I will, I will, um, I'll send it to your emails. It's, it's, it's unfortunate that many people couldn't join in. I had about 4,000 people register for this class, but as well, technology and the technical issues are part of it all. Aside from the squeezing and releasing, is there any other exercise recommended? See, like I told you, Kegels, number one. <clears throat> Kegels is number one. But then the only, the, the only thing is that there are other ways you can reach the pelvic floor muscles. Like I told you, there are some abdominal exercises that can activate the pelvic, um, that can activate the pelvic floor muscles. Okay. Someone said I didn't talk about stimulation. You know, eh? <laughs> This class is supposed to be for public consumption. It's not a physiotherapy-based class. Okay, so I didn't, I wasn't going, um, I wasn't going into details of, uh, I wasn't talking to physiotherapists only. So that's why I said, people should go and see their um, women's health physiotherapists for more evaluation and management. Now, Yes, EMS, electrical stimulation is another way. Biofeedback, there are many ways. Now I'm talking to physiotherapists, okay? There are many ways you can manage incontinence. But see, Kegels is number one. Then, um, um, stimulation also helps. Biofeedback also help, helps. The use of vaginal cones also. Especially when you find out that, your, that a particular client is unable to identify these muscles. No matter what you do, no matter how you teach them these exercises and they're not getting it right, you can recommend a vaginal cone whereby they insert the cone and try to uh, lift it up. If you lift, if, um, the vaginal cone usually has different sizes and different weights, okay? So if you're using the vaginal cone, you start with the light weight. If the person is able to lift it, you progress to the to the heavier ones, okay? Or you can use the you can um, you can use there are some of them that have different sizes. You can start with the bigger ones. If you insert a very big vaginal cone and you are able to grip it with time, you start exercising with it. With time, if you find out you are able to do that, you step up. You you I mean, you start stepping down to the smaller ones. Before you know what's happening, you can grip a cone that is as tiny as this, my biro. So that's for vaginal cones. There are other things you can do. So if you can, you can consult your women's health physiotherapist wherever you are or a physiotherapist around you. It mustn't necessarily be a women's health physiotherapist anyway. So any, any um, physiotherapist around you can help you with incontinence. They will assess you. And then when they find out the type of incontinence you have, they take you on these exercises. They can even do biofeedback for you. Someone is asking me how long it will take. See, you need to be very patient. Just like when you are exercising to lose weight or when you are toning up your muscles, if you are building your, your biceps and so on and so forth, you give it time. It's not something that happens in a week or two. You give it time. But consistency is the key. If you are consistent, you get results. And once you notice that you get too comfortable with a particular pattern of the exercise, you increase the intensity. It's either you increase the number of times you are squeezing, or you increase the number of times you do it in a day, and so on and so forth. So I don't know if I've answered some of our questions. Okay, someone said she seriously needs help to treat her incontinence. Okay, depending on your location, you can check out any, any physiotherapist around you or you can contact me later, depending on your location. Someone says she's always rushing to the bedroom. You, you, may, you may have urge incontinence. Urge, you are unable to hold back. By right, you should be able to hold back until you get to the bedroom. But if you are unable to do that, then that's urge. If you have urge incontinence, I will also advise you to set an alarm. There's what we call, um, there's what we call an incontinence alarm. Set your alarm for every maybe 45 minutes or one hour. You empty your bladder. That way, 
you manage your urge. And then there's another thing you can do. If you feel you are unable to hold it, okay, you can use your hand to press against your vagina and urethra. Your urethra is that part where the urine comes out for, from. You know what children do when they want to wee and they don't want to go to the toilet because they're watching cartoons. You see them, they, they put their hands inside their bum bum. They'll just hold it as if they, they don't want the wee to come out. You can just apply pressure to your urethra or to the, that whole area. Put your hand this way. Just press it. Touch it. It helps you control the urge. Okay, but most importantly, use an alarm. Get prompts. Empty your bladder every time. That's another way you can control urge. You can also stand up and cross your legs. If you, have, if you find out you can't control your urge, most times you stand up and cross your legs. Okay, you know when you stand up, like you want to snap a picture and you are crossing both legs this way in standing. It can help you apply some pressure before you get to wherever the toilet is. Okay, someone said, how is the biofeedback done? If you want to do, okay, vaginal cone is a way of biofeedback because if you are gripping the cone, you are able to, you know if you are gripping it or not. If you are not gripping it, it falls off your vagina. So that's for the cone. It's women that use cones anyway. Another thing, you can teach your clients, if you're a physiotherapist here, or if you're having incontinence and you are here, and you are sexually active, each time you are having intercourse, grip the penis. That's another good time to exercise. Grip the penis. Ask your partner if he can feel the grip. If he can, he should tell you how strong it is. Okay? Can you feel it? You try, to, you know, you keep just, that's a part of exercise. Okay? Um, that's another way of doing biofeedback at home. You can also put your hand on the perineum. If, you are, if your patient is doing a pelvic floor muscle exercise, you can put your hand, or you can teach them to do that. Put your hand on top of your panties, if you are wearing pants. Put your hand there, as if you are putting your hand on the vagina and urethra. When you pick up the muscle, squeeze and contract, you find out that your hand will move upwards. If you relax, your hand moves downwards, and that's it. If you are also managing a patient, you, or you can teach them to insert their hands into the vagina. They can insert, wash your hands, cut your nails if you want to do this. Insert your hands, insert your hand into the vagina, or you, the therapist, can do that. You ask them to contract. You can feel it. Okay? That's another way. Then if you have an EMG machine or a perineometer, you can use it for biofeedback. You insert, um, you, you insert um, um, the vaginal electrode, okay, and then you ask them to contract. You can see the muscle activities on the screen. That's, that's mm -hmm. about biofeedback. Someone said, can stimulation of pelvic floor be done while on monthly flow? It depends on the type of, um, on the type of electrode you are using. If you are using a vaginal probe or a vaginal electrode that you insert inside, you can use it when a woman is on her monthly cycle. And then for stimulation as well. If, okay, if, sorry, if you are using a um, pad electrodes, you know, the type of electrodes we use ordinarily, you can use those ones anyway, even if she's on her monthly flow. But just know that it may increase the possibilities of having a very heavy flow or it can increase bleeding. So you can, if she's on her monthly flow, you can just advise her to be doing only kegels until her flow stops. Then you continue stimulating. Thank you. I hope I answered. Someone said she needs lecture on the use of cones. I think I'll do a video on the use of cones and I'll upload it on my YouTube channel, or I may have to fix another class. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chinedu, thank you. Thank you, any other question? Is there anyone that I didn't attend to her question? <clears throat> okay.
Okay. So can I end the class if we are done for today? How long does it take to rehabilitate the pelvic floor? I've said that. Eh? You have to give it time. You may, you may, dep depending on how serious you are, on how serious you are, you can, you can start seeing results in a month. Very good results in a month. In fact, some people start seeing results in a few weeks, depending on how serious you are with your exercises. Whether you like it or not, exercise is the key to controlling incontinence. Nothing works better than that. Oh, my, you said you dropped a comment for menopausal women. Oh, yes. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, menopausal women. Oh, what, Ma, what was your question? Let me scroll up to see that. Premenopausal, postmenopausal. Premenopausal and postmenopausal women are, ah, they always have incontinence. In fact, one out of every five postmenopausal women have incontinence. It's very, very common amongst them. And um, it's, it's, for, number one is that as age increases, the pelvic floor muscles lose their, their structural integrity. And they, they are unable to, you know, carry out their functions appropriately. Oh, Jesus, I'm muted. Hey, voila, who muted me? Oh. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. For menopause, for post, for postmenopausal women that always have incontinence. See, that's why we train women to start doing Kegel's exercises before they reach menopause. For in fact, every woman should be doing Kegel's. Every woman should be doing Kegel's because whether you like it or not, once once you get to menopause. It will come. Incontinence is very common. And once there is incontinence, before you know what's happening, most of them start battling prolapse. So teach them kegels, okay? Depending on, um, um, you can also use vaginal cones for them. It works perfectly for them too. But when you are recommending cones for them, or if you are using electrode for postmenopausal women, don't use very large sizes because it may cause pain. Remember that postmenopausal women lack vaginal uh, lubrication. Most of them are very dry. So if you're a therapist and you are managing that category of women, please, um, you can use, anyway, you can use a lubricant or you use smaller sizes of electrodes or cones for them. Someone also asked a question, if you are using the fingers, if you are doing a digital examination, do you insert the whole fingers? No. Index finger. Your index finger is better to use. Okay, use your index finger. Thank you. So at this point, I'll end this class. I think we finished, Abi. Any other, you can contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And once again, I apologize for the inconveniences. Thank you.